four days after leaving Southampton on its maiden voyage, Titanic's radio operators received their first warning about drifting ice in the area to which the ship is headed. The message delivered by RMS Coronia tells of the presence of bergs, growlers and field ice a day or so sailing from Titanic's current position. Approximately one hour later, a telegraph reaches Titanic's captain, the highly experienced Edward J. Smith, who had previously commanded Titanic's sister ship, the RMS Olympic. Captain Smith thanks Coronia, part of the fleet of the rival Cunard Line, for the warning. Due to high winds, Captain Smith cancels Titanic's first lifeboat drill. As history knows, this decision would prove to be important. When the evacuation of the ship becomes hysterical, almost 13 hours later. Another warning comes Titanic's way, this time from the Greek ship Athena, relayed by RMS Baltic. It cautions the crew about passing icebergs and large quantities of field ice in the area. J. Bruce Ismay, the chairman of the White Star Line, is on board Titanic. He always travels on the maiden voyages of his ships. Given the calm and clear weather conditions, Smith informs Ismay that a sharp lookout will be kept, and ice will be seen in time to avoid it. Titanic keeps the longer steamer track to New York, which is advised during the iceberg season. The radio operators pick up further reports, this time issued by SS Californian of three large icebergs. Harold Bride, the radio operator on Titanic, delivers this message to the bridge, where it is posted in the notice board for the officers. Titanic's second officer, Charles Lightoller, is in charge of the ship at the time, because Captain Smith is not on watch, and is dining with first-class passengers. Senior radio operator Jack Phillips receives yet another warning from another ship, the SS Misaba, reporting of multiple large icebergs just 15 miles ahead of Titanic. However, there's a communication breakdown. Messages from a ship's captain should be prefixed with the letters MSG, but because Masaba's message hadn't been labelled correctly, Phillips does not treat it with the utmost urgency. Since he is now within range of Cape Race relay station on Newfoundland, he continues to send a backlog of passenger telegrams. Two of the ship's lookouts, Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee, take their positions up in the crow's nest. The task of spotting icebergs, especially the smaller ones, presents a number of challenges. It's a moonless night, meaning that they're gazing into darkness, except for a bright star night and the ship's own lights. Equally, which was rare at that time of year, the water was incredibly still which made spotting icebergs much tougher. If the ocean had been choppier, the pair could have seen water breaking against the icebergs. And to make matters worse, they're without their binoculars, which had been misplaced during a crew reordering before leaving Southampton. A casual but important warning comes from the nearby Californian. Say, old man, we are stopped and surrounded by ice. But in Titanic's radio room, Jack Phillips is too fixated with sending passenger telegrams and the message from the nearby ship is so loud that it nearly deafens him. His response is rude, to say the least. Shut up, shut up, I am busy, he replies. With the SS Californian stationary until at least first light, when it can safely navigate its way out, Californian's radio operator switches off his equipment and goes to sleep after 16 hours of work. If he had just stayed for half an hour longer, he may have received the distress calls from Titanic. 
the later loss of life may have been much less. Titanic now 400 nautical miles south of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland is seconds away from disaster. But despite the numerous warnings its crew had received throughout the day, the ship continues to race ahead at 24 knots, which is just two knots slower than its top speed, because the weather remains unusually clear. Up in the crow's nest, Frederick Fleet spots an iceberg right in the ship's path. He rings the lookout bell three times and calls the bridge, where Sixth Officer James Moody receives Fleet's urgent words. Iceberg right ahead, he screams. Moody transmits the message to First Officer William Murdoch, who in turn instructs Quartermaster Robert Hitchens to instantly change the ship's course to harbour starboard and for the engines to be put into reverse. Although it takes around 30 seconds for the steam powered mechanism to turn the rudder, that's just enough time to avoid a head on collision between Titanic and the iceberg. But the starboard side does make substantial contact, with an underwater ridge of ice scraping along the ship for around 7 seconds. In his cabin, Captain Smith feels the impact and immediately makes his way to the bridge where he's informed of the collision. Many passengers continue to sleep oblivious of what's just occurred and the devastation it has caused. All of Titanic's engines are switched off and the ship now faces north, albeit drifting southwards. The chief architect, Thomas Andrews, is also on board for the maiden voyage and is called to the bridge by Captain Smith. Titanic is separated by 16 watertight compartments. Even if four of the forward compartments were to be flooded, the ship would still remain afloat. But when Andrews assesses the damage over the next few minutes, he finds that five compartments have been torn open by the collision. His conclusion to Smith is not good. Thomas Andrews predicts that Titanic will be completely underwater within a couple of hours, if not sooner. Captain Smith orders the lifeboat to be readied in order for as many people as possible to be evacuated. Stewards move quickly through the ship, banging on cabin doors to awaken the occupants, whether that's crew or fair paying passengers. Since Titanic had not been fitted with a public address system, the evacuation is an unequal one. The ratio of stewards to passengers in the first class accommodation means the latter have greater assistance from the staff, helping to dress and escort them to the decks. In the more crowded third class accommodation, passengers are essentially left to manage their own journey from their cabin to the top decks with directions from stewards. In the first class lounge, the band play to entertain those waiting for the lifeboats. With passengers told to put on life belts, the loading of the lifeboats gets underway. Titanic has 20 lifeboats in total, with a combined capacity of 1,178, little more than half of the number of people on board. The ship had been designed to carry 64 lifeboats, but the White Star Line Company had fulfilled the current regulations and only fitted fewer than a third of them. The idea for lifeboats in 1912 wasn't for a sinking situation, like the Titanic found itself in. Essentially they were intended to ferry passengers from the stricken vessel to a nearby rescue ship. White Star Line decided to reduce the lifeboats so that first class passengers could have uninterrupted views of the ocean from the main deck. With this inadequate number of lifeboats, Captain Smith explains the importance to first officer William Murdoch and second officer Charles Lightoller. He says put the women and children in and lower straight away. By now, several vessels have received the distress signals sent by radio operators Phillips and Bride. 
many are too distant to offer assistance. But Carpathia, another liner belonging to the rival Cunard Company, is relatively close at 58 nautical miles away. Titanic messages say, Come at once, we have struck a berg. Carpathia instantly changed course, but it would still take at least three hours to arrive. The gloomy reckoning is unavoidable. By now, 45 minutes after the collision, 13,700 tonnes of icy water have poured into the ship that's only capable of pumping out 1,700 tonnes per hour. Titanic's fate is sealed as the much nearer Californian with its radio operator asleep does not understand the situation which is occurring nearby and fails to come to Titanic's aid. The first Titanic lifeboat, number 7, is lowered onto the ocean and starts rowing away from the damaged ship. There are believed to be just 27 people aboard it, 38 fewer than its capacity. A significant number of first class passengers refuse to board the lifeboats. Among them is the millionaire Benjamin Guggenheim, who removes his life vest and changes into evening wear including a top hat. He's allegedly said, we have dressed up in our best and are prepared to go down like gentlemen. Others though didn't have an option. Very few third class passengers will make it onto the deck, let alone find a seat in a lifeboat. Unfortunately for the time, many third class passengers were travelling as families and decided to stick together and trust the ship. This is because they didn't want the women and girls to risk their lives on the ocean at night in a small lifeboat, and equally didn't want to abandon the male members of their family, which included boys of 13, who are regarded as adults in 1912, and had no lifeboat places. Lifeboat number 7 is far from the only underpopulated craft, Number 6 is thought to have only 23 people on board. More lifeboats are lowered every few minutes, hardly a capacity. Lifeboat number 1 carries just 12 passengers. Early lifeboats are sent unfilled due to the reluctance of passengers nearby to enter them and because the crew's main goal is to get all the boats launched before Titanic sinks with its lifeboats still attached to the ship. After the first hour following the collision, the downward angle of the ship had stayed fairly steady at around 5 degrees, offering a bit of reassurance to both passengers and crew. However, by 1.30am that angle had increased to 10 degrees as Titanic continued to take on water. At this moment a group of male passengers reportedly tried to rush lifeboat number 14 as it was being lowered with 40 people already on board. Three shots were fired in the air by 5th officer Harold Law, who manages to stop the skirmish. At the wireless operator's station, a gloomy message is sent over the ship's radio and picked up by Carpathia. Engine room getting flooded. 10 minutes later the update is even more worrying. Engine room full up to the boilers. It will be the final comprehensive message sent over Titanic's radio system. The last of the 20 lifeboats, Collapsible D, is lowered from the ship. The last few lifeboats have been closer to capacity now that the fate of the ship is cleared to everyone. Titanic's downward angle gets much steeper as water pours in through open portholes and deck hatches into areas of the ship previously unflooded. A wave caused by a rapid sinking of Titanic causes people to be swept into the ocean. The front funnel collapses and several passengers are crushed to death. Titanic completely disappears under the surface of the Atlantic Many people who have survived the initial sinking 
are thrown into the water. Many died from cardiac arrest within half an hour. Second Officer Charles Lightoller, the most senior crew member to survive the disaster, managed to cling on to an upturned lifeboat. He later described the sensation of plunging into the freezing waters as being similar to a thousand knives penetrating his body. The bow and the stern, now separated, reached the seabed, having quickly corkscrewed to a depth of nearly 4,000 metres in just six minutes. Rockets fired from Carpathia are spotted by those aboard the lifeboats. Having evaded countless icebergs, its crew have travelled at top speed. The rescue begins. Survivors are brought on board Carpathia by rope ladder and slings. Californian arrives at the scene of the disaster, but after a two hour search they find there are no remaining survivors to rescue. The ship's radio operator had only learned of the disaster when he logged back on earlier in the morning. The last survivors are now aboard Carpathia. The decision is made to take them to New York City, Titanic's intended destination. J. Bruce Ismay is among those rescued, having found himself a place on a lifeboat. Ismay has already sent a gloomy message to the White Star Line officers in Manhattan, which was relayed to the waiting press. It said, Deeply regret, advise you Titanic sank this morning, 15th, after collision iceberg result in serious loss of life. Further particulars later. After a challenging voyage through ice, fog and thunderstorms, Carpathia arrives in New York. It originally visits Pier 59, where the empty lifeboats are unloaded to go back into White Star Line's care, before sailing onto Pier 54 where an estimated 40,000 people are waiting in heavy rain. Only 705 Titanic passengers and crew have made it to New York. More than 1,500 lives were lost in the Titanic disaster.